So I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present the work we did at the Swiss Railway Company in the area of optical train localization. So at the CFF, <coughs> we have a research and innovation lab, which is quite new. It's a small but diverse team of applied AI scientists. And we look at many different problems and challenges in the railway industry, which can range from autonomous traffic management over delay prediction to optical train localization, and also many more. I also want to use the moment to point out my colleagues from this research lab, which are here today at the AMLD, especially Eric, which I think after the break in the challenge track, he will present some very nice results we had on the Flatland Challenge. And today I'm going to talk to you about optical train localization. So <coughs> to quickly set the scene, in Switzerland we, enough, we have one of the most densest railway networks worldwide, but already now we're wo working close to capacity. However, we predict that by the 2040, we will have maybe 40 to 50 percent more passengers. So how, somehow we have to increase the capacity by around the same amount. However, as you know, Switzerland is already quite densely populated, so you cannot just simply build more rail, or rail tracks. We have to find a smarter way to do that. And the most simple way we could come up with is just to increase the density of trains on our tracks. So what is stopping us from doing this? Well, at the moment, it's mostly safety concerns. So to guarantee the safety we have at the moment, we are working with so-called blocks or fixed blocks. So the whole railway network is divided into blocks. And at any given time, we can only have one train on each block. So for example, here we have the train in the front occupying the red block and the train at the back has to wait until it's passed out of the block before it can move forward. The next step, what we want to do is we want to introduce dynamic blocks, which would then depend directly on the train characteristics, so on the speed of the given train, on its position and on its braking distance, for example. By doing this, we approximate that we can increase the capacity by the additional 30 to 40 percent. <coughs> so the idea is that let's say we have the middle train, it's moving quite fast, so it has a long braking distance. So we need to allocate a big block in front of it where there would be no other train, just to guarantee the safety standards we have. Well, if we have the train at the back, which is moving slow, has a short braking distance, so we don't actually need a big block in front of it to still have the same safety act standards. However, to be able to implement this, we need to know of every train where it is exactly at any given time in, in space, uh, at any given time. So to do this, the idea is to work with a set of different methods and approaches. Just the idea is if we have complementary methods and one of them fails or is not accurate enough, we will have other methods to take away the errors we might introduce. And at the moment, we are mostly working with GPS and odometry systems together with fixed checkpoints along the tracks, the so-called baliza. However, we found out that these methods are not accurate enough to guarantee the safety and accuracy standards we want to have. So we're also looking at other complementary methods to introduce into our train system. And this is where we come into play with the optical localization. So just quickly here, I want to again point out the limitations or the deficits of the current method. The most important one is that for GPS, if we move into complicated or complex areas, for example, in stations, like you see in the background, GPS is not accurate enough anymore to predict on which track we are. We can say, okay, we are roughly in this area. We don't know if we're on the left track, on the middle one, what happens at the switches, where are we moving exactly. And the second point is that GPS is very susceptible to jam signals or external interference. So I'm now quickly going to show you how we started to proceed to use computer vision to determine the position of the train. <coughs> now the first step, what we want to do is we want to detect on which track we are. To do this, we mounted a few cameras onto our measurement and diagnostic vehicle. Then we used these images to train the convolution neural network to be able to detect the different tracks. And this is what you're seeing here. So in the image here, we have two visible tracks in front of the train. We can detect both of them. Then at the top, this is how we map it. We have an array where you see the two colors, yellow and green. These are the tracks we detected. And now if we know where the camera is on the train and where we detect the tracks in the image, we also know that we are on the left track, which would correspond to the yellow one. Now here's just an example. 
of this algorithm working. You can see it works quite nicely even at different weather conditions. And also here we started to implement not only track detection, but we can also detect other, si other objects, such as signs or signals along the track. Now that we're able to detect the tracks in front of the train and to say on which track we actually are, we want to use this to determine where we are in our rail work, railway network. To do this, we combine the optical detection together with a very coarse GPS signal and our topology database. Then in the first step, we use the GPS signal to determine the longitudinal position of the train. This means where along the tracks are we? If we map this on the topology database, this corresponds to finding the blue square. That's the most accurate we have to be with GPS. Just, we are in this square somewhere. Then we take this square, we extract the track layout from this square, and we combine it with the information we have from the track detection that you can see here. Also here we take three tracks, and we know we're on the middle one. So if we combine this information together, we can localize our train using only very coarse GPS signals. Now, this is quite nice, but we still rely on GPS. So we thought, okay, let's go a step further. Let's go to a train localization without any GPS. To do this, we had the idea to use the kilometer sign poles next to the tracks. So as the one you can see in the right image here. The good thing about these poles is that they are really mapped exactly in our topology database. So if we know where the train is next to which pole it is, we know exactly the position of the train. The other good thing is <coughs> that you have these kilometer signs and each track in Switzerland has a unique fingerprint or sequence of these signs. So if we can read them, we can actually map where we are. So to do this, we mounted a second camera onto our train, which is on the side and looks like sidewards. Then we have another convolution neural network, which is able to detect these signs, so that would be the red image at the bottom. Then we use a Wiener deconvolution filter to get rid of the image blur. We found that that really helps our detection. And then we are the second convolution neural network to read the, the kilometer sign or the, the sign posts, so that we know at which kilometer sign we are. Now, if we combine this information, we can get the longitudinal information of the train localization from this optical method. Then we combine it with the topology database, like we did before, and the track detection to accurately determine the position of the train without using any GPS. So here you can see the whole algorithm as we are exiting the station of Lucerne. So on the right hand side you can see the images of the front camera. As we're moving out, we're detecting two tracks at the moment. At the top you can see the array again, where the yellow one is the track we're currently on. And then in the bottom panel, yeah, you can see it, you can see the kilometer signs that pop up as soon as we detect one. So now we're in the tunnel, now you can see we detected a few, and then we use these two informations together with the topology data to get the localization you see on the left. So you can see we only update it as soon as we detect the sign because then we know, okay, we moved forward. Now I just want to spend the last few minutes in talking to you about what the next steps are in this project here. So the first step is, at the moment, we just get the longitudinal position of the train from detecting these signs. I mean, that, that just means we are anywhere in front of the, the sign. We don't know if we are 10 meters in front of it, if we are 100 meters in front of it. We just know we are somewhere in front of the sign. So what we want to do is we want to use additional computer vision algorithms to not only detect the sign post, but to also determine the distance between the camera and the sign. If we combine that with our track detection, so we know on which track we are, we know the distance, then we can use simple geometry to find out what is the actual position of our train. Further, what we did before is we just used track detection, and now we also want to use semantic segmentation. The idea here is that we not only can detect the all the visible tracks, but we can actually predict the path of the train, as you can see here. So not only detecting the two tracks, but we are predicting, okay, what is going to happen at the switch. And this would be really interesting if you come into more complex areas. So if you detection, it works really well if you have maybe just a few tracks next to each other, but if you come into a complex area in a station or so and you have multiple tracks with really different layouts, then it can also be a bit confusing. But if we could use this prediction algorithm to really map what is happening at the switches, that would be like an additional safety layer to find out where the train is and where it will be in the future. 
If you want to have more information about this part of the project, I encourage you to speak to Pascal Lindner. He's also here, and he was the driving force behind this part. Finally, I just want to show you one last video of the state we have actually running at the moment, where you can see we can predict the path of the train even if we come up to switches. So at the moment, it's only working for simple switches, and we're trying to extend it to have more complicated switches. But for that, we have to generate more training data. So we are, that's what we're basically doing at the moment. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or you want to know about any other AI projects, please come visit us at our booth or check out the challenge track later this afternoon. Thank you very much.